Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to see a very interesting presentation, folks, uh, about a very interesting topic of panorama photography. We had uh, a different webinar uh, about panorama photography. I think it was three and a half years ago, right, Matt? 2021. Yeah. 2021 with uh, our very own panorama god, as we like to call him, Jan Röpenack. Um, uh, whoever uh, had no chance to, to watch the webinar live back then, please make sure to head over to our YouTube channel and watch the recording. And uh, today's topic is uh, Little Planets. Um, Matt, uh, when did you become interested in Little Planets? Uh, what was your first camera that you used to create Little Planets? I got one of the early Ricoh Theta pocket 360 cameras and that really sparked my interest and do you remember when was that was it like back in 2014 2015 because i remember i was using uh, a Riku theta myself very briefly uh, back in 2015 it was probably back like let's say eight years ago it was it was eight a while ago yeah that's that's a lot and then you you moved on you wanted uh, a better quality apparently and uh, you began using uh, one of our pano heads, the VR System Slim, and now the new VR Pro 2. And uh, we're not gonna, or Matt is not gonna speak about uh, the technique that much. We wanna show you how easy it is to create little planets. And uh, he's going to show you uh, some very interesting images. Um, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> so uh, I think with, without further ado, uh, Matt, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Martin. It's a pleasure to be here. Buckle up, folks. Uh, if if any of you were at the Night Photo Summit, I made a, a presentation on the same topic, but this one is different. Uh, this one uh, is really is 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 going to inspire, uh, and we've got a lot of ground to cover, uh, and I'm really excited to share with you. So let me share my screen so that we can start talking about it. And thanks for everybody dropping into the chat and saying where you're from. Also, if you have questions, use the Q&A panel. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions, but I'm going to save that until the end. Uh, but Martin, if you see something that is extremely topical, feel free to interrupt me. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. All right. Everybody let me know you can see, see the screen. We got this going, Martin. Everything good? Everything's fine. Yeah, we, we can see your screen. All right. Tiny planets are fun. And they can make people smile. And that's one of the things that I love about them. Um, but if you're looking to elevate this compositional method to something that's wall worthy, then you're in the right place. So let's do this. Let's jump right in. What is a tiny planet it's it's simply put it's just a panorama but it's a special kind of panorama you literally take a photo of everything in every direction and then assemble it into a fantastical presentation of your choice and you have the control to make it look just right the ground beneath your tripod is the center of the composition and the sky above becomes the edges of the composition so let's explore that a little bit more. This is a group of images photographed in a complete circle, but rendered using the equirectangular projection. It's pretty easy to understand, right? It's 360 degrees wide, a full circle by 180 degrees tall, which is half of a circle, right? And it's presented in a two to one aspect ratio. But a little planet is a stereographic projection. This is another way to arrange this group of same images using the variation of the stereographic projection called tiny planets. That's its common name. And this is what we're exploring in great detail today. So here's a quick overview of the topics I'm going to cover today. It looks simple, but buckle up. This gets pretty wild. First, we're going to talk about setup strategies. Second, we're going to talk about tools. And third, a little bit of a demo about how to edit a final dusk and night blended composition. So talking about setup strategies. <clears throat> First up, how to set up. I'm going to share a ton of single photos from a tiny planet grouping 
and the final results, along with the instincts that turned into insights that I developed along the way. There are key tenets to a successful tiny planet. The visual variation of the horizon makes it more interesting. So some objects have to be higher than you. Some should be lower if possible. And some should be at the same elevation. Keep that in mind the whole time that we're watching this. This should come as no surprise. But do practice when it's easier to see. Because, you know, I'm a night photographer. And I prefer to do photography when it's harder at night. But if you practice during the daytime, you can see what you're doing. And a little bit of drama in the clouds can help you out. But when you practice in the daytime, you'll be ready for the nighttime. So here's a single frame from the same location, but at night. And here's where surprises happen. You got to be ready for them. If you scattered during the daytime, there's still surprises at night. The spot I wanted to use was unusable because of a bright light that remained on all night long at a nearby construction site. I scooted around to the other side of these rocks. And this is what I made. Now, you might recognize this from the opening of this presentation, right? But let's talk about it. I used that shadow created by that strong light source as an advantage. Do you see the almost cat eye shaped shape that the shadow makes? going from the rock around to the horizon near where the aurora is. Honestly, I didn't know that was going to happen. The field of view was just too wide to conceive of it. But I knew the light source in my image would not work, which is why I repositioned myself. And then I made this. Now here's another one. Now I get to talk about my boots. <laughs> When I was speaking to Rachel Jones Ross before last year's Night Photo Summit, I asked her for advice because she was in Lofoten, Norway. She gave me advice that Kawai Lin gave her. Get knee-high Arctic wading boots. And I did. And boy, am I glad I did. I was standing in a fjord almost up to my knees to get this perspective. And I was thrilled. I could see this. I knew it was going to happen. And getting that ring within the ring was 100% worth it. And also, God, I love the boots so very much. Continuing with the footwear topic for absolutely no reason at all. <laughs> here's a photo of my trail shoes in Rapa Nui. The Ahu platform that the Moai stand on at Anakena Beach is much taller than the ground on which my tripod stood. And you can see flat ground right there, right? Um, so I guess this isn't about footwear. It's about being mindful of the subject and landscape elevations. And this is what I talked about in the beginning. The Moai are on a platform that's much taller than the ground I'm standing on. And that's why you see it swell above the green circle that's in the center there. And then off to the bottom right, you can see there's another hill shape. And then in the bottom left, you see this ring of palm trees there. And they all decorate the shape and make the shape irregular along with the moai in the backdrop of the clouds. So choosing the place that you're going to be to accentuate these things is an important part of your development as a little planet photographer. Sometimes the light changes. And it's really best to have a rig with click stops. We'll talk about this later. And a wider lens if possible. And we'll talk about this again later. <laughs> In this case, I was using a 24 millimeter lens. I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. Uh, but again, we're going to talk about lenses later. So this is one frame from a tiny planet that ended up being this. But I made it work. But I had to hustle at the end of this. Because right after this came a snowstorm. And all of that beautiful light that you see here went away in moments. So shoot fast when the light is changing. Back to nighttime. Again, developing your sensibilities about choosing wicked cool topography. 
to feature in your tiny planet is part of the process. So here on the canyon floor, which was largely flat, I was looking at the steep sides of these peaks of the canyon here in Capitol Gorge and Capitol Reef National Park and saying, wow, in a normal situation, I'd say some of these are too tall for me to shoot without extreme keystoning. And uh, what am I going to do? I'd rather punch in with a long lens, which I did with a different camera. But here, I decided to do this. So I shot a 360 of this, and I was able to get the Milky Way. And in the end, that one single frame is just part of a, a larger, more complicated composition where I photographed the bottom frames separately from the top frames. The bottom frames were shot at a lower ISO and longer exposures, and the top frames were shot for star points at shorter exposures. And actually, they were tracked, but I don't want to talk about that here and now, but it's a blended composition, right? The point I'm trying to make here is that the topography, you can accentuate that and choose that one peak that I really loved right there and make it the star of the final composition so that it is projecting out. And then you see sort of this round sort of marble shape, which is uh, a key to these tiny planets. And then you see the rest of the landscape and it all points towards this one thing. And this is a manipulation I did during the assembly of the panorama. This one was shot under a full moon with an Astro modified camera. Now, why would I do that? Well, my regular camera was busy making star trails. So I had my pano rig and I positioned my tripod over a really cool rock formation at the edge of the cliff. Now, I, I, say, I have it on screen here, but I just want to say, whenever you're shooting near the edge of something, please be very careful. But this is the result. So we go from one frame of this to this entire spherical panorama. Now, this is under a full moon. This is Acadia National Park. This is the coast, of course. And I really wanted to see what a smooth sea level horizon line would do as it met the rocky and evergreen skyline. I was also very excited to have the moon burst and the reflection on the open ocean. As a contrast element, it was really interesting to me to see what would happen. Uh, and I do love having strong celestial elements that scream that this is a night photograph. So you could look at this and say that's the sun until your eye lingers around the sky and you start to notice that there's stars too. And then, and then at that moment, you're like, oh gosh, this was photographed at night. And it's moments like that, that, that I look for, that I strive to bring to my compositions. I also like to say strong man-made geometric shapes, such as this bunker at Sandy Hook in New Jersey, really make for strange results. So I didn't know what was going to happen here, but I had a feeling that it was going to be really cool. And it's kind of like the earth sciences diagrams that you see showing the earth's core when you cut down, you know, be beneath the earth's mantle and the crust down to the magma, the, to the core. That's what I feel like when I see this. Uh, and it looks like it was excavated, which in fact, it kind of was, it was either built up or excavated, but it's got that cool look because of the tall walls surrounding me inside the bunker. I did wait for moonrise to crest on the edge but I specifically didn't wait longer because I didn't want the flatness of full moonlight in there. So this one was a lot of fun to create. Now, lighthouses are fun. Now, you see how the lighthouse sort of keystones a little bit here? It looks like it's leaning back and tapering off. I mean, naturally, it is a little bit narrower at the top than it is at the bottom. But also notice how I hid Gabe, Gabriel Biederman, there in the shadow on purpose. So I put my camera in the shadow, I put Gabe in the shadow, and this is what I did with it. And now we have a true Little Prince moment where there's strong shadows and strong light sources. And one of the things that I found is that when you manipulate your compositions, well, you can keep things parallel like the lighthouse. 
And then you can see the beams of the lighthouse spreading out into the sky. And then the moon on the bottom right hand uh, side at about three o'clock. Um, yeah, makes me a lot of fun. So next, shooting downtown with storefronts can be really richly rewarding. You might be wondering, what can I do with a downtown? Well, if you put your lens pretty much right up against the storefront window, you're putting the awning right overhead. And then you can do stuff like this. So if you work with these extreme exaggerations by placing that awning nearly at the zenith, you're going to see that things get really tall. And now we're talking about elevation differences, right? The sidewalk pinches in at the waist of this photograph, but then you have the buildings on the top and the bottom. And I think this is where tiny planets really start to shine as you get closer to your subject. But don't stand in the middle of the street because that's dangerous. Seriously, don't do this. But if you do, you might get compositions that look like this, uh, which I was, this was a sleeper. I had this in my catalog of shot images, but unprocessed. And it was only back in January when I was preparing for the night photo summit that I found this and processed it. And now it's one of my favorite pictures. One of the things I love are the painted lines going straight down the middle of the street. But I do actually love seeing my downtown Catskill, you know, popping out on the sides at blue hour, right? So this one was a total what if gamble on my part. I had no idea what would happen or even how I would render it. But I knew that if I stood near this locomotive, this engine, uh, that uh, I had the question was, what's going to happen to the rails that go underneath it? How am I going to do that? Well, it turned into this. It's a total mind bender. All aboard the infinity train. <laughs> this is a tiny planet, but with your cursor, you can drag and move it. This is the manipulation part of it. It's the art part of it. I decided to render it inside out so that the sky is on the inside and the ground is on the outside. Uh, and then I did deliberately darken the edges outside the rails. And this one was a real pain in the ass uh, to get everything to match up also, because I don't think I really nailed my no parallax point on this one. However, when I was done overcoming all those technical limitations, I made a photograph unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And I'll probably get close to some other stationary, mind you, stationary locomotives and try some similar compositions in the future, because this is thrilling. So I just want to point out, if you seek strong leading lines underneath your tripod or tripod legs, you can do cool stuff like this. And the other one that we saw also was this. So this is the standard projection for a tiny planet. And this is an inverted one where you take those lines underneath the tripod and make them on the outside instead. Another thing you might consider is, you know, when there's so many people shooting in so many directions, if you shoot in groups, I wanted to take all of their back of the camera lights and flashlights and make them work for me instead of saying, you know, these, these are not ideal. These are not part of the composition that I want. I do like people in my photographs too. So I made them a part of it. So in this case, the tripods and the lights give the foreground depth. And I also caught a huge meteor. But no surprise, this was during the Perseids meteor shower or the practice night before the peak of the Perseids meteor shower in 2023. If you top it off with the Milky Way bend and some awesome green light pollution, thank you, Alamosa, Colorado, we have a weird tiny planet that just speaks volumes about the life of a night photographer. You can see us doing what we do. Somebody's laying down, somebody's standing up. Somebody's looking in their bag with a flashlight. Practically all the things in our life as night photographers happen in this one photograph. Here's another what if scenario. The following evening, the peak of the Perseids meteor shower. Um, I wondered what would happen if I made a tiny planet rotational sweep. We'll talk about what that means. And then left my camera pointing straight up skywards to capture all of the meteors for the Perseids meteor shower 
and make a radiant composite to blend together with the tiny planet. Again, I was just curious, so I did it. I rolled the dice. And my first inclination was to honor the radiant, you know, which is what I worked so hard to capture and process. And that's why I put the radiant in the center here and had the landscape around it. And this projection was, it was okay, but it didn't really just do it for me, right? The bendy tripod legs actually make me anxious, I, I suppose, you know? So I went back to the drawing board and I made this. Now this meteor shower radiant is no longer a radiant. Everything's not coming from one place that we can tell, right? But who cares? All the meteors are falling to earth and the Sangre de Cristo mountains and the great sand dunes on either side. It really turned into a winner in my book. And that sky, mind you, is a composite that's made over many hours. The meteors are the composite part of it. The stars part is a single image over which all the meteors were rotated and laid over. We've made other webinars about this topic, about how to photograph and edit a meteor shower composite. You can find that on the YouTube channel. Now, speaking of many hours at the zenith pointing straight up, this is what I call a star trail topper. I didn't invent it, but it did occur naturally to me. So it's an option that I thought of uh, far before I saw others that had already done this successfully. <laughs> I don't mean to make, make it sound like I'm patting myself on the back. I talk about this because I want to stoke your natural curiosity, which is where this was born, right? And ask yourself those what if questions like, what if I made a star trail straight up and stitch that in? Unfortunately, I got a call 30 minutes into this sequence and I had to stop it and then head home. But I still made this. This is what happened with 30 minutes of star trails and a full moon in the sky. I did crop that out. It's in the bottom part of the frame, but that's why the sky is so dark and so few stars. But the star trail topper is something that I would continue to pursue. I really, really like this approach. So I did this again on an even colder and windier night. And I did it with the moon visible also. Here in the Catskills, there's not a lot of clear winter nights, maybe like 20% of the time, if I had to put a number to it. So with the moon visible, like a fuzzy caterpillar cross, crawling across the sky, I used this star trail topper to make this tiny planet. Now my car looks like it got smushed. And I think that's, well, it's definitely, it's that's an artifact of A, being too close to it, and B, being at the same height of the car. If I dropped my tripod down, then the car would have been taller on the horizon. But I really didn't want it to collide with that tree line. So this was the choice I made, right? But I really like this effect of having a Star Trail topper on a mini, on a tiny planet. Uh, composition. So you'll see more of these in the future coming from me, and hopefully you'll try them out too. Now, I just want to point out cloudy nights don't have to be a reason to pack up. You know, when you travel thousands of miles to get someplace, make the best of it. Make those clouds work for you, especially if there's detail in the clouds. And that's what happened, you know. You travel all the way to Rapa Nui, to Easter Island. And you make pictures no matter what, right? Back to Catskill, Twilight is your best friend. Uh, I made these images of the courthouse in Catskill Village where the sky was darker than the foreground. And this was a deliberate tactic. And it turned into this. Boom. Instant drama. And with a courthouse, you know, of course, there's always drama. But I think that this is really imposing. And heck, it's a lot of fun too, right? Mannequins or humans that stand still are instinctually eye-catching. We like to look at other humans, right? So why not put them in the right place? And it's also well-timed, and it's chosen for a specific contrast scenario. 
the inside of that is brighter than everything else that's around. There's no artificial lighting that I applied in this scene. This is all found lighting. So the brighter shop window draws the attention. And so does the mannequin. In this case, you can play with the position of things, the flagpoles and the monument. I deliberately put my tripod where it was, right? And then look what I did with the projection, right? So the flagpoles had a clear sky and they're sticking way the heck out there, but the monument did not. Uh, if I had moved over to the left a little bit, the monument could have been clear in the sky. I might go back and shoot it that way, right? So again, this is more examples of choosing places to put your camera and the results, a place to put your camera, lamp posts against the sky and the results. And then trees can also be a wonderful thing, but you need to be careful because they can dominate your image. And you can do that on purpose or not. The closer you are, the taller it's going to be. And this is the results, right? That house is lovely. And it's sort of an afterthought when you see it, right? So the other thing you need to think about is, you know, light pollution. During the daytime, we don't think about it. But at night, we definitely see a lot of it. So we think about it all the time. So I put light pollutions behind things like trees. And then you get to make things like this. Now the light source, which was a disadvantage, becomes an asset. Now, looking for mo motifs, repeating patterns is really powerful. Tiny planets are generally circles. So if you find things that are circles that repeat, it'll reinforce that globe shape. Uh, now, standing directly underneath a hard line can be risky, but that's until you see the results. Straight lines can become circles. It's mind bending. Nothing is real. Just kidding. So what happens when you move fully undercover? Well, you start to see this happen. And then the outside becomes the inside. And it's like we're living in a Douglas Adams book. Nobody gets that joke. I love it. And then another example of being partially undercover is this, right? If you get under some really interesting stuff, you can make it render like this, which is, you know, your typical... A uh, tiny planet look, right? Or then you can invert it and you can see something like this. So there is other things that you can do. I'm showing you uh, for the sake of time, just a screenshot here. This is where I was down in a valley at 11,000 feet and the peaks around me were much taller, 14, 15,000 feet. So this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this was shot at dusk and two hours later with the stars. And I'm going to show you a demo of this a little bit later at the end of this presentation about how I assembled it. Uh, but the idea is that huge elevation differences, and I walked into this scene, never seen it before, and I, I saw this immediately. I knew what I was going to do. And it started by seeing these peaks all around us and me deciding to set up on the edge of a river. And I love that. So I hope that all of this is fertile ground for you to imagine the opportunities and come back and replay it and look through these and take notes uh, about opportunities for placement of your tripod uh, adjacent to things that are interesting. Now, pump the brakes for a second. Let's talk about what you need to make thrilling tiny, tiny planets. We're going to talk about gear. First, let's start off with lenses, and we're going to move along pretty quickly because this is being recorded, and you can always come back to it, right? Honestly, start with what you own. Don't go out and buy anything special until you know you really want to do this, right? And if things aren't as fast as you want them to be, there's options. We'll talk about them. Uh, and different people get annoyed by different things. So I'm not going to tell you what annoys you. I'm going to tell you what annoys me and when I decided to change. You can use any wide angle lens, right? Here's some examples. I've used all of these to make tiny planets, 12 millimeters, 14, 20, and 24. The Z and N here, right? Basically means that you need to shoot the Zenith straight up and the Nadir straight down, right? So an easier way to look at this is this chart. I aim for 50% overlap in night photography because in PT GUI Pro, which is my favorite go-to piece of software, you need to give it enough information to match up where to blend. 
to stitch things together. So overlapping 50% is your first guarantee of success. So if you use a 12 millimeter lens, you're really going to want to do at least three rows, not two. Um, and then it goes up from there. And you can come back and look at this chart. But I just wanted to show you, you really don't have to shoot a lot of rows. Um, and how many per station you have to do is a little bit, it varies on the focal length. There are other presentations we've done here about how to calculate your field of view for this. Uh, you can refer to those webinars to check that out. There's a lot of ground to cover here. So we'll find a link and put it in uh, the recap to this in the description in the chat. But here's an example for a 24 millimeter, I had to shoot four rows plus one straight down. So that's a lot of pictures, right? With a 12 millimeter lens, you can do it quickly with just two rows, but it's not a 50% overlap. And you notice my straight up image has a little bit past the zenith, right? And my straight down image doesn't because you can't shoot past the center of your tripod. So you've got, let's say, 30% overlap there. And you can get away with a 12, 12 millimeter lens in two rows. And I've done it. You basically have to have like 10, 20% of the landscape uh, on your sky shot and 10 or 20% sky on your uh, ground shot. And then you should be able to stitch those. So, yeah, it's risky to not have 50% overlap. Only do this after testing and getting comfortable with the process, right? But you don't have a single level horizon shot, which I like to have. Um, so it makes, sometimes it might make your stitch a little bit risky that way, but not impossible. Hands down, easiest way to do tiny planets is to have a circular fisheye lens. Pay attention to the published field of view. You want to have 180 degrees or more. If it's just 180, that's perfect. That's perfect. It doesn't matter. You can theoretically take two pictures and be done with it, like those twin shot cameras, the ones that have two lenses on them. But you can't get 50% overlap there. So at the edges, you might find that there's stitching errors, right? So that's why I shoot at least four and sometimes six images. This is an incomplete list of circular fisheye lenses for different cameras, but just look at the list. There's a bunch of them out there. Some of them are expensive. Most of them are not. Um, it really depends on whether it's autofocus or not. But, you know, consider these. There's some cool stuff out there. I use the Nikon one. I showed you that. I'll show you some more about that. And if you have a crop sensor, you can also get a, an even less expensive fisheye lens. And there's a ton of those out there. Many of these are just manual focus, and that's totally fine because you basically have infinite depth of field when you're shooting so wide. So this is what looking using a circular fisheye capture looks like. And this is the bird's eye view looking down on the camera, right? So you're going to take four images, one facing straight, turn it to the right 90 degrees, turn it to the right 90 degrees again, and turn it to the right 90 degrees again. So those four images, you can make a tiny planet. Here's the results of one of the images that you shot before, or I'm going to show it to you again anyway. One straight up and one straight down also. So those last two images you see in the sequence are straight up and straight down. And this is the result. Now, why do we do this? Because the center of the lens is the sharpest part of the lens. Those edges, you can see, it starts to get chromatic aberration and it starts to get softer. So you don't want to count on those to make a good stitch which is why I shot six, and this is a super sharp stitch everywhere. And I have one other thing that I want to share with you that helps. The focal length doesn't change the projection whatsoever. This is a test that I did with four different focal lengths and just plugging it into PT GUI and saying, hey, make me a tiny planet. They're exactly the same rendering with four different lenses. The surprise is it does affect your potential file size, and this can be a shocker. Can your computer handle it? Because just an eight millimeter lens on my 24 megapixel camera turned out to be an almost 400 megapixel composition, the final composition. Now, of course, you can export it from PT GUI Pro uh, to be smaller to your size. You could say 100 or 50 megapixels instead. That's up to you, right? But you're still working with a composition that has that pixel dimension. 
So, but the 24 millimeters has 3,642 megapixels for me with a 24 megapixel camera. So the wider you go, the less your computer is going to need to process. All right, let's make this simple. To make tiny planets, just get a panorama rig. I've tried every single way of doing this. This is the best and most reliable way to do it. And you're not going to be fixing parallax errors. You will instead be having fun and making lots of tiny planets. This is my complete kit without being specific about the models, right? Basically, it's a tripod with a built-in leveling head, or you can add on a leveling head. That's a must-have accessory. You have to be level. On top of that, you put a panorama rig. And on top of that, or attached to that panorama rig, you put your camera and an L bracket. I use, for the most part, a full-frame 8mm fisheye lens. It's fast, right? You can also, as we discussed before, use a super wide lens, like an 11 to 15 millimeter rectilinear wide angle lens or any lens. It's true, right? But the panorama rig, I think, is a must have. Let's just go through this pretty quick. Uh, you can always come back on the replay. For my standard mirrorless cameras, I use the VR System Slim and my Trio Balance NovaFlex tripod. For my larger mirrorless cameras and long lenses, like my Z8, I use the VR System Pro 2 HD and the TrioPod Pro 75. I could use the Trio Balance also, but I prefer to use the Pro 75 and the balancing head underneath that, the Embal Pro 75. This is what the VR System Slim looks like. It's tiny, it's compact, it weighs 1.3 pounds. It mounts on practically any tripod, but it does require a balance, balancing and leveling head underneath it. They all do. It packs down small, and the vertical axis has detents every 10 degrees. There's a lot of other detents on the bottom rotator. And this is my kit. This is a Trio Balance with the VR System Slim and my Z6 and the 8mm lens. And you can see I can rotate the camera in any direction and have it be parallax free. And also I can shoot the straight up and straight down images. This is the VR System Pro 2 HD. It weighs 3.3 pounds. It's a lot heavier, but it's a lot heavier duty. That's the HD part of this heavy duty, right? Uh, it can be supported by a Trio Balance or a Pro 75. It's much beefier for heavier cameras and long lenses. The vertical axis also adjusts in 10 degree increments, but it has a locking knob uh, and a push button as opposed to just a wheel locking knob. So. This is my larger kit, just so you can see how they look. Um, this is the TrioPod Pro 75, the balancing head, and then the VR System Pro 2 rig and my Z8 with a nail bracket on top of that. But let's talk about the Nadir, right? These all allow you to shoot straight down. And here's an image on the right of me shooting straight down, right? So you're going to have to use content aware uh, or a separate image to make the tripod disappear. Uh, that's just the, the tricky part of this, right? If you're shooting in the daytime, it's pretty easy. You take your camera off the tripod, step one foot to the right and take a picture. But at night, it's a little bit harder because you're taking multi-second or multi-minute images. So you need to leave the camera on the tripod. So that offset, it's called a Nadir offset, can be done this way. Uh, NovaFlex has some accessory clamps that you can do this with. And basically, because the vertical rails are all ARCA compatible, you can take this extra clamp and just put it on the side and clamp your camera to it and shoot straight down. So on the right, you'll see shooting straight down into your tripod. On the left, you'll see the offset. So you can shoot straight down to the ground and not have to make up what's in the center of your image when you're assembling this. I'll explain quickly what these are. Martin can answer in the chat what this is, and we will post links to this stuff. If you're interested in this, these are additional accessories with, for the kits, but I found that it helps a lot with not having to use AI to fill in the gap in the middle. So the Q-Mount D clamps in the same direction, the Q-Mount DC clamps in the opposite direction, and the Q-Mount XD clamps in either direction. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. I'm not going to bog down the rest of this presentation with that. I just want to put one other thing in here. A benefit of owning the NovaFlex system, 
I'm packing to leave for Arches. Uh, I leave in the morning. This is my actual kit that I'm bringing with me to do a pano intensive workshop. It's a small hard case, a little Pelican, right? But I've got two tripods and legs, I got the pano rigs, a walking stick set, the hiking tripod, a mini tripod legs, spare leveling head and some more. Uh, it all takes up less space because I can take it all apart. Moving on, you all know I love NovaFlex. If this is your first time seeing this, you can take everything apart. It's a system. When you set it up, you should see our other webinars to, to learn about centering your camera and finding the no parallax point. It was a little too much to put into this, but basically you want to center your camera on the rig to make sure that uh, you're rotating it around the correct areas and also set your no parallax point so you don't have any uh, stitching errors. That's what that prevents. Now let's talk about editing. I know everybody's like, how do you put all this together, right? Well, <clears throat> in simple terms, I suggest you shoot dusk for your, your first shots, right? If once you're done doing the daytime shots, uh, you'll see how this gets put together. But for night photographers, the people I normally speak to, um, it's really great to shoot the landscape when there's detail, which is why we shoot during twilight, dusk, whatever you want to call it, right? But we do like the stars also, which is why we shoot at night. But those two things don't happen at the same time. During dusk, the sky is a little bit too bright to see all the stars you want to see. So we're really taking two different sets of pictures, one during twilight and another one during darkness. And that's just where having a pano rig comes into play. It's repeatable. It has click steps. It's got graduated markings on the bottom of it. And here it is set up. My camera is leveled and my tripod is on half in a river and half out on the side of a bank. But everything is leveled above where that little ball is, right? And I can rotate around it and I can shoot repeatedly. And I did. I shot about 10 times through dusk and during the stars. So this is calibrated and no parallax point is there. So, but I did shoot at two different times, right? So if you're using your blue hour, this I'd like to tell everybody about because it's a surprise and it's heartbreaking if you traveled someplace and you didn't do this, you should choose use an HDR capture method for your landscape because if you're shooting in every direction, one of those directions is going to be towards where the sun is setting and that sky is significantly brighter than the landscape. And if there's any detailed edges there, you're going to see that the trees at that edge are going to have too much contrast to blend well. So I shoot HDR sets through all of twilight so that I can have an entire sequence for the landscape that blends well. I process these HDRs in Lightroom first to taste because I have the most control there. PT GUI Pro does allow HDR processing, but I find the, the control that I have with a DNG created HDR in Lightroom is much better than the ones, the controls that I have in PT GUI. So I process those individually first, and then I send them to PT GUI for stitching. So this is the landscape. I shot this. Press pause, wait two hours, and it's dark, and then you shoot the stars. Now, these days, you can shoot just a single image because of AI denoise in Adobe Lightroom Classic. Back then, when I shot this, I shot star point stacks. So each one of these was 10 images in each position and then ran through what's called Starry Landscape Stacker to create these high quality star point images. You don't really need to do that these days, but you could if you wanted to. So these were sent separately to PT GUI to process as a separate tiny planet. But let's talk about the processing. In Lightroom Classic, you have to process them to taste, meaning you want to make them look like they should while they're still a raw file. Yes, PT GUI can handle raw files. And I think with daylight photographs, it's totally okay. But nighttime photographs have such nuance uh, that I don't find the editing tools within PT GUI to be sufficient for doing that. So I like to edit them where I have the strongest tools and that's Lightroom Classic. But here's some things that you should always do before sending it to PT GUI. Your taste might be different than mine. 
Um, you need to make sure all the images have the same processing adjustments, all of them, right? That will help the stitching and blending. Some of them can't be different than the others. It seems obvious, but it's worth saying. This also includes especially eliminating vignetting. So the edges, the corners aren't darker. Applying your lens profiles. That also affects vignetting and sharpness and lens aberrations like barrel distortion. And if you do use custom camera profiles like I do, you can apply them to everything and then your colors sort of pop into place. I've made other videos, webinars about that with Calibrite. You can check those out. Processing those. So you're going to spit them out. You're going to use the plugin in PT GUI that says edit in PT GUI. And it's going to create TIFFs of each one of these, right? And you're going to load them into PT GUI. And then in the window where you look at the projections, you're going to choose the preset called Little Planet. It's pretty simple. It just pops right up. Now, when that happens, you can do one of three things. Uh, at least the ways that I do it, I have three different paths that I choose. The first strategy that I have is to use their masking tools which is pretty rudimentary. It's a green mask to allow something, a red mask to say no or an eraser, right? So you can use those things and you'll see on the left here, I processed all the images and I sent them to PT GUI and I used their masked, right? And I let them choose where to blend everything. And it turns out that it was a little bit too noisy so I went back and I went back to Adobe Lightroom Classic and I applied uh, the AI denoise and sent it back over. And I also, at this point for the right-hand image, chose which parts I wanted masked. So the masking tools in PT GUI are very powerful, saying use this part and don't use that part. So, but what they don't do is selections. And selections are where Photoshop is king and Adobe Lightroom Classic is getting better. But to select something and then mask it is something that you just cannot do in PT GUI. So if you have simple things like broad, even blue skies like this, the masking in PT GUI will be sufficient. The second strategy would be to open up one of each image, a landscape and a sky image, as smart objects in Photoshop and then edit them side by side using a Adobe Camera Raw so that you can make them look like they belong together. Like a blue hour image and a, a night image always have different color, right? So what you would want to do is make them more color harmonious um, and then take those settings and copy them to the other images in Lightroom Classic and send those through as batch to PT GUI Pro. You're going to do the same thing and you're going to say the tiny planet projection right? This is what I did with that shot from Colorado, that last example that I showed you. You're going to leave them both open in PT GUI so you can compare them side by side. And this is what it's going to look like. You're going to see two different projections, but this is two different projects in PT GUI open at the same time. And I drag them around with my cursor until they're roughly the same shape. And this is where you then export those two separately as TIFFs, and then you're going to open them as two layers in Photoshop where you can mask and blend them together. So like I said before, I shot, you see how it looks radically different? The one shot at dusk, even though it's in HDR, and the one shot two hours later uh, that was shot during darkness, there was a ton of sky glow or air glow that night. That's why it's so green. Uh, I didn't remove it because it's A, natural, and B, I like it. I like the color. So in Photoshop, I'm going to layer those two TIFFs, the foreground on the top. I'm going to select and mask the sky from the foreground layer. And I'm going to use layer adjustments for final harmony edits. Uh, hold on one second. Okay, so back here we have the... Photoshop, layer two TIFFs, foreground on top, right? And then you're going to do final harmony edits, and it's going to look like this. This is a very complicated, pretty huge PSB. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's about five gigabytes, this PSB. 
But this is what happens when you take those other two and layer load them as two separate layers and simply mask and blend them together. You achieve harmony. Now, I had to take the landscape image, which was ever so slightly different, and make it a little bit larger than the sky image, just so I didn't find those rough edges uh, that weren't perfectly rendered exactly the same in PT GUI. But no one can tell. You wouldn't have known if I hadn't told you, right? So this was the second strategy that I have uh, is to do that. The third strategy I have um, is, is using an older idea, actually. Um, if you spit out your TIFFs after you process them to taste in Lightroom and you open them up in PT GUI, you can then open them in Photoshop and apply an alpha mask to the ground for the sky images into the sky for the ground images, meaning you're going to block out the parts that you don't want. The reason you would do this is because Photoshop is much, much better at detecting edges with different selection and masking tools, right? So it's primarily the selection tools you're using here, not a mask. You're going to select the area you don't want to show. You're going to create an alpha mask, and it's going to save it as empty pixels, although it's not deleting those pixels. It's just another layer. It's another channel, not layer. It's another channel in that Photoshop TIFF file. Once you do this, you're really talking about having crispy, clean, perfectly rendered edges, which then PT GUI will honor. And this is what you're dealing with. You can then go back into Photoshop and play with uh, those alpha channels and sort of clean them up a little bit. And this is happening inside of PT GUI. It's not happening inside of Photoshop. This third option allows you a way to make your final composition inside of PT GUI. And this is great for time shifted stuff, like what I showed you in that second example. Um, the foreground here was, and I talked about this much earlier, the foreground here was shot uh, static, like four minutes per shot. The sky was one minute sh per shot on a star tracker. So it had fuzzy edges, right? But I was able to take those two time shifted sets of images and blend them together in one place in PT GUI here. This topic is much, much larger than uh, a single webinar can talk about. Uh, I wanted to give you a way to, to organize your thinking about where to start with the processing. A full processing demo should really be its own thing. Um, but I hope that this helped those of you who are curious about how to put it together uh, to do it. Some parting advice here. It looks a little messy. It looks a little complicated. Guess what? It's not. The most important thing is that you get out there and just start it. You're not really going to get it until you've done it, right? So there's a reason our eyes face forward. You know, it's too much to conceive of all of this information at once, right? So go practice during the daytime, have some fun and try different heights, you know, try shooting near, near the ground, try getting up on top of something and shooting waist level and comparing those things. If you are really excited about this and you want to take further action, um, well, go to nationalparksatnight.com. Once a year, basically, we do a pano intensive workshop on location. That's what I leave for tomorrow. We're going to Arches National Park. Uh, or if you're local, you can come up and visit me in Catskill, New York. We can work something out. Or I do one-on-one -on -one time stuff. Sometimes I travel. So those are other options if you really want some one-on-one some -on -one tutorial. I'm also working on an online course. It's almost done. Uh, it might be a month or two, but it's going to be there. Uh, if you go to matthillart.com slash tinyplanets, you'll be able to see uh, a way to sign up. No obligation whatsoever, but you can give me your email address and let me know uh, if you're interested in being the first to sign up for it. Now, I, lo I know this is a lot of ground to cover, but I definitely wanted to leave some time for Q&A. So let's see what we've got, Martin. How are we doing? Hey, Matt, we're doing great. Um, thanks for another insightful and great webinar, man. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure having you here with us and explaining uh, about the intricacies of this technique. And um, 
there's some questions uh, that uh, that we have uh, that people have uh, to you, but there's one question I have before we jump right into the Q and A. Uh -huh. uh, did you yourself ever sneak into one of your own little planets? <laughs> That's no. I, I mean, there's a, there, there's there's some empty space on on the globe part of the little planet, right <laughs> in the center. Oh man! Did you ever try that? I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, I I have ideas. I have a list of ideas. I actually have a bullet point list that's probably around fourteen right now okay. of things that i haven't tried with little planets yet that i can't wait to dig into and okay. what I wait for the day when i see uh, a little planet with you in it with you yourself in it <laughs> okay thank you man uh shall we jump right into the q a yeah let's do it um okay um let me see what we have um Jürgen asks uh, do you need ptgui to stitch circular fisheye images or do lightroom or photoshop do that too to the best of my knowledge you cannot do it with photoshop or lightroom you may be able to load up that many images and it's going to try and make a projection that is uh rectangular not spherical um mm -hmm. photoshop there is one way to get to this result um and that's called the polar projection um and it takes that means you're taking you know that um two to one ratio 360 by 180 image that i showed you can load up one of those images into photoshop and choose i think it's filter polar projection and it's going to make a circle out of it but the huge difference between photoshop and pt gui at this point is where that edge meets again you're going to have to do some fudgery uh, it's not going to stitch them like PT GUI will. So that's the first difference. Um, I had some slides in the other presentation I did a week ago. Um, you're going to need to use some sort of blending or AI replacement to make those edges meet perfectly. The other thing is it makes a perfect circle, which is not a disadvantage. It's just different, right? It doesn't make a square or rectangular window like PT GUI does. It makes a perfect circle. So if you want to have anything outside of that, you're going to have to buy a circular frame to frame it or, you know, mat something with white around it. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think it's cool because it does look like an eye, but you're not stretching the edges to, to fill out a rectangular or square uh, composition area. I hope that helps. Okay. So we have another question from Ian. Um, in a landscape conference, Scott Kelby laughed at questions about the nadir when making panos. Is it really that important with little planets with software as good as they are today? It, it depends on your intent. If you're going to show images on Instagram only, mm -hmm. probably not. Okay. Uh, if you're going to make prints, uh, if you're going to allow people to pixel peep, on your images if you're going to use something where the final composition is above a handful of megapixels 10 or 20 if you're going to do something that's like 100 megapixels you can see those details so you're gonna you're gonna have to handle a, a couple of ways a pt gui allows you to put a badge in there you could put your uh, logo there which is what a lot of people do when they're using this for a purpose that i don't do which is like google street view that's a spherical pano it's the same thing but when you drag around a pano where you can see in any direction, you have to be able to look down too, or it restricts the view. You can put something down there. It could be your logo. It could be what was there. So the, the Nader is, uh, it's really up to you whether it matters, but it has a lot to do with what your intent is or where you're showing your work and how you're showing your work. Oh, perfect answer, I, I think. Um, and there's another question. Is it from Ian as well? No, that's Andrea. Could you speak a little bit more about the Nadir angle and how to get rid of the tripod base? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I can. Um, let me let me find. A, I have an example of this. Now you have to share all your little tricks. Well, with our I mean, audience, but I think that's why we're here. Yeah, there's um. 
there's a lot of things. It's a big topic. You know, it's, 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 it looks simple in the beginning. Uh, and it is simple to start and it is simple to do this. However, um, once you get it, start getting serious about this, there's a lot of opportunity um, to get serious about the details. And th that's pretty much where we're drawing now. Uh, the Nadir is, and I'm trying to find the slides that I skipped. It's in a different presentation. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to find those so I can show you. Aha, here we go. Give me a second. Da, da, da. Oh, I, I can show this. Um, here. I'm going to show a little bit behind the curtains here, folks. You can see um, window. This. Okay, good. Sorry. There we go. So this is going back to what Jurgen was asking about. Um, this is, there's a polar distortion filter. That's what it looks like, the polar distortion filter. So that's showing what the 2D looks like. It's just a circular image. Um, let's see what we got here. The Nadir is, I'm trying to find that. I'm sorry. I wasn't prepared to answer this question. So um, let's just let's just say that um, if you're going to do this, you're going to have a photograph of the your tripod and you're going to use a selection tool in Photoshop to draw around it. And you're probably going to use content aware fill to make that go away. And that's the simplest way to say it. that's what I do on the regular. If I shoot without a nadir offset um which is honestly more often than not now i'm getting into the habit of doing a nadir offset because the ai image replacement tools are fantastic but not perfect and i would in some cases i do want it to look like it happened instead of something guessed about what it should look like so this is where your, your threshold of how much effort you're willing to go to versus the net results comes into play. Um, and again, this is me after shooting how many years of little planets I've decided to increase my complexity a little bit to get that little bit extra of an edge. So that the center of my image is not fabricated pixels. It's actual pixels. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. And there's a last question in here. And I think I found two other questions in chat. And then okay. we're all the way through. Uh, what computer do you use and what kind of time does it take to run a stitch on these? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a MacBook Pro uh, from 2021. It's an M1 Max. And I have 64 gigs of RAM. It's it's a really well out fitted computer laptop uh, but I also edit video sometimes uh, so I don't have any hiccups or issues with PT GUI on that laptop <clears throat> but the best recommendation I can give to you is to get as much RAM and GPU as you can that you can afford to make this work out um, and shoot fewer images so the wider your lens is the fewer images you have to put into PT GUI. If you're using a 24 millimeter lens, it's going to be a gigantic stitch. Um, I have to give a shout out to my friend, Mike Murray. Mike, I've uh, known for 15, 20 years. He's the first person I know that was shoot, excuse me, shooting tiny planets. Uh, and he was doing it back when it was hard, when there was the cheese grater Mac G3s or G5s, what G5s. And he was taking hours to render stuff in PT GUI back then when the program wasn't even as sophisticated as it is now. I'd say any modern computer within the last two to four years should have no trouble handling a regular image set in PT GUI. That's, that's my assessment of it. But you can find more information on their website. And I just want to be really clear. PT GUI Pro is what you want to use, not PT GUI because there's a couple of extra features that just matter so that the extra 100 150 bucks whatever it is is worth it okay thank thanks matt um 
right after the presentation started, John asked, can you just use a 180, 360 lens camera such as a GoPro Fusion? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You can use any tool that works, for sure. The the interesting things about stuff like the uh, Insta360 X3, which I own and I use as a scouting tool, uh, and other dual camera spherical recording uh, cameras, devices, re video recording devices, is that they should allow you to adjust the composition. And I know with Insta360, I use my phone to adjust the composition by dragging like this. This is very much the same way that I use my mouse to drag the composition in PT GUI Pro. You're limited to the hardware that's involved with that uh, that GoPro, let's say. Um, so it's whatever the chip size is, it's sensitivity to high ISO or low light. You got to find your sweet spot. If that works for you, fantastic. That's fantastic. I believe I've been working on this lately, a way to pull in the Insta360 files into PT GUI to render them better than the, <laughs> than the Insta360 software can do that. And I know that uh, a lot of people use drones to shoot spherical panoramas, and they bring those images into PT GUI also to finish them, to finish them better than the provided software can do that. So that's something to consider at the pro level or the, the let's say the high seriousness level. Um, then you might want to reach for a piece of software that helps you do the job better. But I think that if that hardware works for you, totally great. What I don't find good is the sensitivity for low light and I would say lens selection, but we're really talking about fisheye lenses here, right? But if I wanted to use other lenses, I could not. You're, you're stuck with the built-in ones. Uh, but it can go anywhere. You can do it underwater, and that's an advantage. So. And that's not something you would want to do with a VR Pro 2 HD. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, two more questions are coming in. Uh, Andrea asks, I have shot tiny planets, and I have gotten a belly button where the Nadia should be. What is that? If you're referring to uh, missing data, the belly button being that mm -hmm. like it's just a hole that's yep. where your lens was not didn't cover enough didn't, didn't cover the ground, ground. Yep. yeah like let's say this is where the tripod is and like your lens only got down to basically where the tripod foot is with its field of view right it didn't go all the way down to the center of your tripod so what you're what you're probably experiencing by the description belly button is just missing data it's still rendering the entire projection, but it's saying, I have no information for the center part, the belly button. And that's where if you draw a little circle around it with the marquee or the, the pen tool in Photoshop and say content aware fill, you can have Photoshop decide what to put in there by painting around the edges of it. And finally, Brenda, she's here with us in the background. She asks how much time for the render? Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. That's a loaded question. If, if, it, <laughs> if I used a 24 millimeter lens and there's 48 pictures in, in my composition, it might take, uh, and I told it to do full size, which is like, I don't know, it's too many megapixels. It could take a, a few minutes for my laptop to spit it out. But I find myself more often than not, uh, reducing the megapixel output unless I have a reason to have the maximum megapixel. I tell it to do 100 or 400 or 500 megapixels as the TIFF to spit out, spit out. And that takes a few seconds to maybe 20 seconds at the most, depending on the size. But if I do 100 megapixels on the regular, it takes four seconds to, to spit out on my laptop. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. I think we... Andrea, it did, it did look like an inner belly button. Well, I've never seen that, Andrea. I'd love to to know what software. You Another need. question. See an image. I missed. It. Oh, I missed that. Sorry, Andrea. No, that's that's fine. I I did see it uh, come in, Andrea. If you just reply to the email we send out after the webinar and send me an example of that, I'd love to uh, consider it. I might not know what it is, but I'd be happy to guess. Okay, man. Thanks for another resourceful uh, webinar.
thanks for sharing your knowledge about this uh, interesting topic of panorama photography. And thanks for sharing your creativeness in, in showing us all these uh, awesome images. Wow, and I'm waiting for my little planet with you in it. <laughs> Maybe you'll be in it too. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe in September in Utah. That would be fun. Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Thanks for, for listening. Ask more questions if you're seeing this on the replay. Ask us on YouTube. Uh, we'd be happy to reply. And we look forward to seeing you next time. And we will be sending out an email uh, once uh, the replay becomes available on either Big Marco or YouTube. Thank you. Bye. Take care.